Well, good afternoon, Christ United Methodist Church, friends, and family. It's uh, Pastor Jeremiah coming to you again with this week's Upper Room Devotional. And uh, it comes to us from today's date, October 7th, and it's titled, Where the Big Fish Live. And it's written by Doug Wingert from Arizona. The topic of the day is focused on James chapter 1, verse 12, which reads, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The word perseverance is a hard word for us to hear. It's the advice that we always get given to us whenever we're trying something hard. Keep trying. Keep practicing. You'll get it. Don't give up. There's always those signs you can see the cat hanging on the wall from his paws in the front saying, hang in there, things will get better. We're constantly over and over encouraging people to keep trying, to persevere. Athletics is one of those first places that I've ever faced perseverance as a young man. Um, you get pushed to your limits and then you find out you got more in the tank somehow. I played football for six, seven years of my life. Actually, seven years now that I think about it. It's the one sport above all other sports that I love. I love it because it's a game of inches. I love it because it can always come down to who works harder and practices. It's not always just about talent because there's 11 people on the field at any given time for a team. It's about how best you work together and keep fighting together or persevering together. I've been on the fields on a Friday night where everything looked hopeless, but we kept taking it one inch, one yard at a time. We were able to claw out from behind some deficits that we wouldn't have ever thought. But mainly where I think of perseverance when I think about my football activities is during two-a-days and during practice. You know, those times where you're running and running and running. When you can't run anymore, you still keep running. It's in the heat. And in my school, we used to have these bushes at the end of the uh, goal line um, on both sides of the practice field. And more often than not, people would be found in those bushes puking during those times. And I can remember always during those two-a-days, the fact that it would be like a 100 people out trying out for the team. All kinds of people. Um, people who looked like they should have been on the team last year and this was their first time out. New kids from other schools who had moved into our district or into our very specific team. Kids that had never played football before but really wanted to play. Part of two-a-days and part of those practices was to thin the herd, so to speak, to get people to give up or quit. There wasn't that many roster spots. We couldn't keep all 100 people on the team. It would be huge. But instead they would work us. They would run us. And some of the more talented people would end up quitting or end up not making the cut because they didn't persevere. I can't tell you how many times we'd be running gassers and, and those are something if you don't know what they are, you're running 10 yards down and back, down and back, down and back. You keep adding 10 yards till you get to the 100. Before you know it, you've run like a thousand yards in all full sprints. It's, it's ridiculous. And how many times I watch people walk off the field, back to the practice house, leave their helmet behind, and never show back up again. I couldn't understand how people could give up on this. I mean, I love to play the sport. I love to be a part of the team. And so it couldn't make any sense to me to give up, to quit. I had to keep going. There was always a little bit more in the tank, and I just had to try a little bit harder. Push myself. Yet... My junior year, I got injured. I had thought I was going to play, and, and I blew out my knee. Nobody's fault, just a weird kind of tackle. And uh, I lost most of that season. I didn't get to play, and I didn't get the sense that I was going to get to play as a senior either. So I decided I was going to focus on something else my senior year and give up football. It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made. I, was, I felt I was one of the better players on the team, but I wasn't given an opportunity. It didn't seem like the coach and I hit eye to eye, and, and I had a lot to learn looking back about following instructions and being where I was supposed to be instead of trying to make a play. So I took that summer off. I missed two a days. I'd drive by the football field and see my teammates out there on that team on that field and wonder if I had made the right decision. 
I missed it. I missed being pushed. I missed being yelled at and, and, and scorned for not being in the right place. I missed being with my teammates. And I finally realized I had made the wrong decision. I didn't really want to give up. I had invested too much and wanted to be a part of that team regardless. And I would finally come to a place that wasn't really about whether I started or not. In fact, it was more important that I was making my teammates better, that I was showing up and doing the best I could and then trusting the coaches to do what was best. That was a hard thing for me to do. I, I like to kind of be more, much more in control. Um, but letting go of my desire for the greater good of the team was what needed to happen. So I came back. I asked the head coach if I could be on the team after I'd missed most of two a days. And he said it wasn't his decision. It was up to my teammates to decide and that I had to ask them. Of course, I went and appealed to them to let me be on the team and told them that I'd do my best to make everybody better in practice and that I had no expectation of playing or starting. I just didn't want to miss out on my senior year and to be with them. They readily agreed that I should be there. And I worked my butt off to prove to my teammates I was there for the right reasons. I ended up starting every week that year. It was the first time that I had ever been respected by the, the defensive coach at the time, or at least as far as I understood it. I know, no, he was trying to make me better. But at the time, I thought I was getting picked on. But my attitude had changed. I decided I was going to put all of it into it no matter where it was. And on the practice field where I could make people better, that's what I decided to do. By doing so, I won over my coaches that were questioning my commitment and was given opportunity to do something I've never, I'd never, ever, ever want to take back. That season, playing every Friday night, was one of the best seasons of my life. Not because I was playing, but because I was a part of something on a team. I had won the respect of my teammates and my fellow peers and had been given an opportunity that I had earned through hard work, through dedication, and through persevering. It was a hard decision to face, eat crow, so to speak, and to face my peers and to tell them I was wrong and that I was being selfish. But I couldn't give up. I had to take those steps. And so I wasn't like those that gave up and quit, even though I almost did. Why do I share that with you today? I, I share it with you because... It was a formidable place in my growing years. I, I learned that I had to never give up, that I personally, if I had an interest in something, couldn't back away from it. I had to keep going, put my head down, do what was necessary, put in the time, and that in so doing, I would eventually be rewarded, whether it was in the reward of learning, even though I didn't meet the expectation I had hoped for, or whether it was in the fact that I had earned what I had deserved through the hard work, through the perseverance, through the dedication. Those times helped me become a better man. When I had to work, and I had to work 80 hours a week at some points in my life, and I didn't have it in me anymore, I was tired, I just wanted to give up, I knew I had more in that tank because I had pushed myself in other ways. I knew I could keep going. And when it came time for me to uh, start over, to give up working and to seek education so that I could sit here today and be Pastor Jeremiah, I was able to persevere through those, persevere through those hard times too, knowing that somehow I would get through because I had tested myself before. I knew I could continue to test myself and that with God's help that I would get through. That's the other part of this perseverance thing. I don't think there's ever a time that we stop needing to know how to persevere as a pastor, I spend lots of time counseling with many people. Perseverance in your marriage when it's a struggle. Perseverance in relationships with your children when there's division or, or upset or fear. Perseverance in your work and your career. Perseverance in your church. I mean, look at how we've had to persevere as a nation. You know, COVID, shelter in place, quarantine, sickness, political divide, you know, all the things that are going on, the racial divisions that exist and the hurt that we've inherited across hundreds and hundreds of years because of the perseverance of bad ideas. This idea of persevering is something that we can never let go of. In fact, it's all we're really left with as humans. We're eventually all going to age or suffer or deal with letdowns and frustrations. And we're really left with two choices in that place, to give up or to keep going. 
our spiritual journeys are often very similar to that. They're interconnected in ways. I can remember not being able to play, blowing my knee out and wondering what I had done to deserve this and, and crying out to God to fix it or to show up somehow and make it better. I'm married 22 years. I've struggled in my marriage. I've struggled in my career. I've struggled with late nights trying to stay up to get through grad school because I had procrastinated, another P word, but procrastinated doing my paper. I had to put 20 pages together the night before a paper was due. My own darn fault. But I could have just gave up, but rather kept pushing. And I've watched so many people in my life persevere beyond understanding. I've watched people who deal with great disabilities and have excellent reasons to give up, continue to strive and to thrive, to move forward and to grow. People with no arms and no legs finding ways to still participate in athletics. I mean, look it up. There's incredible stories of perseverance. And when we see those stories, we're all so motivated. There's something deep inside of us as humans that wants to participate in that story of overcoming. That's why, you know, the underdog story is such an important story for us as Americans and throughout the world. You know, beating the odds, going farther than you thought was even possible. And even as I sit here now and I'm thinking about perseverance, I'm thinking about people who are dealing with sickness and disease and health issues. People who are going to be sitting on chemo or going through dialysis, or facing the loss of a loved one? How do they keep going? Where do they find that strength to push on? I believe it's a gift from God. This human spirit, this indelible part of us that says there's always more. We can get over the next hill. We can keep trying. And so when we do find struggles they do intersect with our spiritual life. We can see ourselves as those who are sick or struggling in our relationships or struggling in career or life or facing jail or any type of burden. And we can let that destroy us and knock our faith down, so to speak, to cause us to doubt in God and God's love and goodwill for us and humanity or God's interaction with the world bringing good out of all the evil that we as humans bring to pass persevering. What do you do? Well, we have to have faith that God is a good God all the time. And most of us who have any kind of relationship or walk with the divine have experienced God's love and goodwill for us. But this world is a dark place at times. It's a struggle to remain focused on the good when all around us things seem so upheaval, turned upside down, topsy-turvy from the will that we have. And then we can wonder, why did God do any of this? Like, what the heck are we here for? What if it's all about persevering? What if everything that we're called to do is to face struggle and tension and turmoil in this life so that we can demonstrate our desire, our human nature, that image bearer, we are all the image of the divine, those created in God's image, that no matter what we face, you can't really hold us back. You can't really hold us down. When we are driven and determined, either as individuals or as a group, united in a purpose, we can do, a, do and accomplish amazing things. You can accomplish amazing things. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what the news may report, no matter what you're observing in the world that seems so out of balance or out of order with the way it ought to be or should be, know that you can persevere no matter where you're at and no matter what you're facing. The things that we endure do not have to mean that we question God or do not mean that we have to question whether or not others are in it with us. See, perseverance sometimes takes people on the sidelines, a team, a community, a church family, neighbors, strangers, and others to pick us up, to dust us off, to say, you can do it. We need each other. We need to know that God is with us. And we need to know that no matter what we face, God will still be with us. So what do we have to fear? You who are image created, given God's very 
divine essence within us to be creators of our own worldview, our own understanding, creators of what we see in the world, we can bring the harmony we hope for in our personal relationships. We can bring the harmony we hope for in our community or to our team or into our church. But if that harmony doesn't start first inside of you, you have nothing to give. We have to be those who persevere first ourselves in our faith journey, persevere no matter what we face, and who are those that have faith in God's goodwill above all else. Perseverance also means we're going to push ourselves, try new things, go to new places. Perseverance invites us during quarantine or shelter in place as a church and as we face the uncertain future going into the fall and winter months to keep going, to keep doing church in new ways for those that are listening, to keep going about our lives and, and doing things as family members and as communities and as schools by continuing to try, to struggle, and to adapt and improvise and overcome. What do you do? What else can we do? We can lay down and give up, or we can keep on fighting. Keep trying new things. And if things don't work one way, try another way. Keep going. You can do it. And God is with us in the process of it. Now, our devotional today is very similarly minded here. It's titled again, Where the Big Fish Live. And it writes and reads, I recently took my eight-year-old grandson fishing for the first time. We spent much of the day casting our lines into the middle of the lake. He was excited to catch and release some small sunfish, but he really wanted to catch a bigger fish. As the day wore on, he suggested we cast into the shadows where the water was full of reeds. I told him it would be risky, that we would probably get our hooks tangled with the reeds. But Grandpa, he said, I think that's where the big fish live. So we cast into the shadows and our lines got tangled with the reeds more than once. But we persevered and finally knew the thrill of hooking a big fish. Jesus did not promise us that following him would be easy. It may seem safer to keep our usual routines than, and re, than rather to take a risk by speaking out and acting on our faith. But James tells us that if we faithfully persevere, the Lord promises us a great reward. Well, truly, we can learn a lot from this story. You know, you could persevere by keeping casting your line into the middle of that lake to find a big fish. But sometimes perseverance calls us into change, calls us into doing things in a new way to try new environments, to try a new direction. Perseverance for us as a church has meant that. We can no longer worship inside the way we once did. We can no longer do our fundraising or stewardship the way we once did. We have to find new ways. And so somehow in the middle of that, you end up building a tower outside, getting an FM transmitter so you can listen to church in your car, doing food trucks in a lot, or finding all number of ways to connect and stay gathered even though it's not indoors the way we've always done it. We've had to go find new terrain, to go off the map, so to speak, to find a new direction. It's scary. That's another reason why sometimes we'd rather not try to persevere, because we're not sure that the effort is even worth it or it will end in the, way it, in the best outcomes that we hope for. Going into new terrain, going off the map, there's no promises. However, just like this young man who had a sense that going into different waters may get him different results, so to speak, net different outcomes, <laughs> net, no pun intended, that it was worth the risk. And they faced struggle and hardship, casting lines into the reeds, getting them hooked and tangled, eventually led to the outcome he had hoped for, getting the big fish. So we can expect that when we go into new areas, when we try to change and do new things, when we're dealing with new illnesses or sicknesses or when we're dealing with struggles in our homes or wherever you find tension in your life, that trying new ways to solve those problems is going to be difficult at first. You're going to get tangled up in it. But if you don't try new things, if you don't keep going, you'll miss out on some amazing outcomes. It would have been easier for me to continue to try to find happiness in my life by working harder at jobs I didn't love. It would have been easier for me to, to prove to that coach that they had screwed up by not putting me in my sophomore and junior year. 
But I would have been the one that missed out. I wouldn't have gained what I learned. And I wouldn't have had the opportunities that were so beautiful that shaped so much of my life since. And continue to shape my life as I persevere here in my own life, in my own relationships, and as a pastor here in this church in 2020, where it's very difficult to figure out what's right, to know which is the right direction, how to keep moving forward. I'm lucky. I'm lucky because there's a group of people here that are my church family who are rooting for us to continue to succeed. I don't persevere alone. I do so in a context with friends and family and people who are well-wishers within the community egging me on, cheering me on, maybe even proverbially holding the signs, you can do it. And we truly can. Because the outcome, whenever you face struggle, is growth. And all of us can use growth in our lives. So I encourage you to try new things, to continue to struggle no matter what you face, to persevere, and to know that you don't do it alone, even if you feel so. God is with you. God is with us. Emmanuel means God with us. We who know Christ in his way are those who are invited on a journey to share how God has persevered in the person of Christ to reveal God's love to all God's creatures. We're asked to do the same and to never give up. We're called into a holy, holy mission. Not to put members in a church pew, not to grow your denomination, not to somehow be the most successful church in town, but instead to continue to share God's good news, that God loves us, loves you, loves your neighbor, loves the person you don't really like that well, and loves the people that explicitly say they don't even love God. God loves us all. And he perseveres. His love never fails. God is the perfect example of perseverance. God will win out in the end. God's love and perfect will for his creation will eventually be aligned with humanity's will for creation. God will keep calling out to us as churches, as individuals, to align our will with his, to make the world as it is in heaven on earth. When we get there, we'll still have to persevere because as soon as we get to where it is that we're hoping for, we have to continue to fight to keep it that way. This world, as far as we can monitor it, as far as science goes, is always moving from order to chaos, from chaos to order. We have to continually struggle in all that we do. So don't avoid the struggle. Don't give up on the struggle. Keep going, no matter what you see or what you face or what the world around you screams out you ought to do. Look at God within you and know that you too are called to be a part of the plan. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the wisdom of children. Give us courage to take a risk and persevere for the sake of Christ. Meet us in our struggles. Meet us in our tension. Meet us in our churches, no matter where they are. Meet us in our homes and in our career places and in our hobbies and all the things that we put our time to. And help us to be those who seek your goodwill that never fails, your love that is always there for each of us. Demonstrating true perseverance, that love never gives up. So help us to emulate that, O oh God. In your gracious and holy name we all pray. Amen. Have a good afternoon, good evening, and no matter where you are, know that God's love goes with you. Talk to you soon.